In this video, I'll be discussing how we process electron diffraction data from spot patterns that we obtain on the TEM. Now, just a heads up for the measurements, I'll be using the Thermo Fisher software VLOX. If you don't have access to VLOX, you can use a free software like ImageJ. The overall process that I describe is the same and it's really independent of the software. So to start, we have a spot pattern here. We're looking down a zone axis, and let's pretend we don't know what this mineral phase is. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to measure the D spacings, so the space between the central transmitted spot and R1, R2, R3. And I'll talk a bit about what those are in a second, but the important point is we want to measure the distance for these different lines through the central transmitted spot. And it's more accurate if we measure multiple spots and then uh, divide by the amount of spaces that we measured through. So in this example, I've passed through four or three, four spots, and then I go through four more. And so this is a total of eight spacings. So I just want to make sure that I'm really centered on the spots and that the overall line is crossing the other spots so there's not any weird warping or something in the pattern. So I've done that here and I need to do it twice more because we have three different vectors, R1, R2, R3. And so I've sped up the video because it's the same process. We're going to measure the other ones. And now we have what are probably R1, R2, R3. So in VLOX, we can change the color and the size of the font and things like that. So I've quickly done that just so I can see the values. Now let's talk about R1, R2, R3. So I'm going to show two different patterns. Here's the first one. And there are rules that tell us how to assign the different vectors to the spots. So the first rule is that the vectors of R1 and R2 should equal R3. So that's why in this example, the blue line, which is our blue vector R3, it falls between the placement of R1 and R2. So you can imagine adding these vectors, the orange line plus the green line gives us the spot where R3 is. The second rule is that R1 should be the largest value in real space. In inverse space, or what we're looking at in the diffraction patterns, R1 will appear to be the smallest distance. Lastly, the angle between R1 and R2 should be greater than or equal to 90. So these rules are how I assigned these spots. So we're going to show a second example. And again, we follow the same rules, but now it's a little clearer that the distance in reciprocal space or inverse space for R1 is smaller than R2, which is smaller than R3 and the angle between R1 and R2 is closer to 90 degrees. So that's how we assign our R1, R2, R3 values. Now let's talk about how we get the literature data or the theoretical data. There are a number of different structure databases. Um, I have other ones in the description linked below, but the one I prefer to use because I'm a geoscientist is American Mineralogist. We can search using chemistry, and so if we know based on compositional work like EDS what elements are present, then we can select the elements that are there, exclude the other ones, and then search based on that. Alternatively, we can use the despacings that we measure and do a diffraction search. So we select despacing, we type in the values, and then the tolerance is plus or minus some value that you're willing to let the system accept. So if you really have no idea what your phase could be, this is a good option. But what I typically use is actually just the mineral name. So that's the first box. We just type in the mineral name because I usually kind of know what the possibilities are. I'm typing in magnetite here. Our structure is not magnetite, but it's the same process. This gives us five matching records, that's, or 85 matching records. That's a lot to go through. So what you want to do is uh, you could look at the year it was published, because if it's really old, maybe it's not so accurate. Some of these aren't pure minerals, so that was titanium magnetite. Maybe we don't want titanium. Some of these might be high pressure phases. Um, in this study, it was a high pressure study, but this was done at zero GPA. The, 
the materials might be synthetic, they might be natural. In any case, once you find a good match, you can download the diffraction data. You can also download the SIF file, which we can use in single crystal. I'll talk about that later. So once we have possibilities, I have a Excel spreadsheet that I use to auto calculate my despacings based on the output from VLOX. Because VLOX outputs in inverse nanometers, I have it auto correct for that. Because I also measure through multiple spots to make it more accurate, I go ahead and average out that or divide by the number of spaces. So I'm just typing in the measurements that I had and then we can type in the theoretical values. So once we have um, the actual despacings, we can then assign these to R1, R2, R3. Because remember, R1 is the one that looks the smallest in reciprocal space, but is the largest in real space. And once we've assigned these, we can now measure the angles. So I'm using the angle tool within VLOX, and all I do is kind of follow the R1 line, the R2 line, and I put the spot, uh, the center on the transmitted spot. So I then type in my angles, and this is actually more accurate if you do it on both sides of the central transmitted spot. So I have the two basically symmetric angles, and I'm now doing it for R1 and R3 on both sides, and then R2 and R3. And so this spreadsheet takes the average of those two. So now we're going to compare the literature data to our measured data. So this is the diffraction file that I got from American Mineralogist database. It gives the despacing and the HKL of the planes. And so I want to see what the closest values are to my measured values. So I have 5.79 and I get a good match for that on the 111 plane. This has a multiplicity of eight, meaning there are eight symmetric spots that have the same despacings. So you can assign R1, R2, R3 the same planes if those do exist by symmetry. So R1 and R2 both matched 111, and then R3 best matches 200. Now we're going to take those HKLs and we're going to do a cross product and I have Excel auto calculate this for me as well and that cross product ideally will give us the zone axis. This can take a lot of iteration though so it can be time consuming um, and sometimes you're lucky and you get the different zone axes at the bottom here all those cross products to match but sometimes that's not the case so I'm going to type in um, R1 for G1, R2 for G2, R3 for G3. But remember, 111, we can't have two of the same plane. So I'm just using a symmetric value because the multiplicity was 8. So I use minus 111 and then 200. Zero, zero. The zone axis is essentially 022 two, two, or 011, one, one, same thing. And so I'm using this software single crystal because this will simulate my pattern. And now I can measure the angles based on that simulation. So this is the structure for pentlandite because that's what I believe my mineral to be. If I hold control shift and then left click on my mouse for the three spots, uh, R1, the center spot, R2, that will give me the uh, theoretical angles. And in this case, we don't need to measure on both sides because this is a simulated pattern, so it'll be perfectly symmetric. So this is my result. Green means good. I have a percent difference that's pretty good. And so my match is down the 0, 1, 1 plane of Pentlandite. So now you know how to index spot patterns.